If you look at the 19th century as a unit in time, it was a period when basically the major decisions, short of the Civil War, were made by the legislature, not by the president. There were very few so-called strong presidents in the 19th century. The conventional wisdom would say that you start with a strong president, Jefferson. You have to wait until Jackson for the second. You have to wait until Lincoln for the third. And some would say if they believe that the veto power is important, that the only other 19th century strong president was Grover Cleveland because he used his veto pen. I don't think he comes up to the level of the other ones, but nonetheless, he often is cited. Well, if you have that, if you have only a handful, not even that, a couple of fingers of strong presidents, what you do is to open the door for legislative activity in the field of foreign policy. It, 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 again, it's, it's vastly oversimplified because at least the name of Monroe is attached to the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. And certainly the actions of Lincoln uh, during the war between the states, during the Civil War, uh, belie this generalization. But we didn't really get to the era of the strong president until we turn to the 20th century with first Theodore Roosevelt, then Woodrow Wilson, then Franklin Roosevelt, and it goes on. So we have a staccato list of strong presidents in the 20th century, unlike the short list in the previous century. Well, what does this mean in terms of foreign policy? It means that the initiative is swinging from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other. It means that over time, with, of course, little bumps and sags in between, is swinging in the direction of a strong president, possibly in part because we've gotten ourselves into a more international, into the field of international activity. Uh, and this would start, well, it would start with Theodore Roosevelt and his big stick policy. Theodore Roosevelt negotiating at the Port Portsmouth Conference the end of the Russo-Japanese War, uh, World War I, good illustration, uh, U.S. activity, even with neutrality legislation in the 1930s because of the pervasiveness of the Depression, a world depression. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable story of the aggrandizement of power. And to get back to my source again, Corwin has an argument that's worth mentioning, that every time a president does something that is expanding the role of the executive branch, he is contributing to the growth of a pool of presidential authority. And the Corwin argument is that over time, this pool has widened. It never really shrinks. The question is, when does the president want to dip into it? Uh, or when is he content just to let nature take its course, as it were? Uh, this means that when Lincoln suspends the writ of habeas corpus, he sets a precedent that others can follow if they choose to. So it's a question of volition, not capacity, that we're, we're talking about. But in the 20th century, this pool has certainly widened. It widened with the big stake policy. It widened with Woodrow Wilson wandering around Europe. Well, he didn't really wander, but it, it, Woodrow Wilson in Europe at the end of World War I. Uh, it, it shrinks a bit in a sense, or it seems to shrink, when the U.S. does not join the League of Nations, when the U.S. delays ratifying the treaty ending World War I. But by World War II, you've had two extraordinary illustrations of what the United States can mean in the state system. One, that we tip the balance in each war so that it's feasible to argue that we could have lost both world wars if the U.S. presence had been obliterated or it hadn't existed. So if a moment comes when the U.S. is the tipping mechanism, is the moment of uh, 
decision in a world conflict, then we're taking, we're giving to the president, who is the commander in chief, powers that he has to utilize. And I wandered from public opinion, but in each case, it was necessary for a president to have at least a significant element of public opinion uh, supporting his initiative. It was in, in the unrestricted submarine campaign of the Germans in World War I that made it simpler for the U.S. to enter that conflict. And it, of course, was Pearl Harbor in World War II that made it easier. Public opinion switches in both cases. You can see a, a desire to sort of let them fight it out in both wars, people anxious to sort of have the conflict end without American participation. But in both cases, there was a threat to U.S. sovereignty, a perceived threat, a threat that the public could acknowledge. And the result was that each president could get into the war saying that this is not a war of choice, it's a war of necessity. After all, the Germans, by declaring war in World War II, eased the strong, I don't like the word isolationist, but isolationist sentiment at that time, which was already moving we're into the age of polling by the time we're in, the, uh, in Franklin Roosevelt's administration. And you begin to see then that what you have is a public which is saying, we don't like what we're about to do, but we're going to go with it and give as much of our support as is necessary. Never as we can, but as is necessary. So the more recent illustrations, Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan, which are dissimilar. Analytically, they shouldn't be regarded as interchangeable. They're not. But nonetheless, in these cases, you have a public far more exposed to the realities of conflict than ever before. Vietnam was called, title of a book, The Living Room War. It came into the American consciousness every afternoon and the three networks of the time. And of course now with internet, we have a, a consistent set of opinions thrown at us, not just through the filter of the media, but thrown at us raw in the various devices that make it possible for individual not only to have his or her say, but to exercise the power of invective, the power of assault, and the power to disagree.